Welcome to an excellent edition of Rebellion's Education Elk Series. We've got Chetan Karakas, brilliant energy mind, head of British Petroleum's Quant Unit, here to teach us about what is going on with big data and AI in the energy industry today. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Glad to be here. Are you using machine learning in energy? First question. Yes, like uh, I think everyone we do use. Um, if you look at the energy markets, uh, the, the interesting thing about the energy markets are there are kind of a two aspects of it. There is a kind of uh, financial or paper trading side, which is like similar to the what you would see in the other asset class. Like yeah, hedging, hedging your you know your output, of course. Yes. Yes, or uh, hedging hours, or hedging, or uh, designing uh, bespoke uh, um, uh, risk products for our customers. Like for example, airlines or uh, producers, uh, they like to, for example, hedge the price risk. Right? No one wants to kind of be at the at the mercy of the. I've got to interrupt you. I had breakfast about two years ago with the head of Shell's AI division, and. Don't want to bring up any names, but that person told me at the time that Shell really wasn't sure how to use machine learning and they were kind of just dealing with it from an exploratory basis. And when machine learning had been used in Shell, it had been kind of on a one-off basis by the engineer who decided to use it for that project for whatever specific. And there was kind of no firm-wide AI protocol. Uh, at British Petroleum, do you guys have a firm-wide AI protocol? Or are you guys, do you guys have a vision? Um, I mean, I can't really s comment on the specific of the uh, British Petroleum because I'm not really representing them. Um, yes, I'm, yes. I will talk in uh, I'm a kind of personal capacity. Yeah. We definitely have a different, obviously, uh, BP is a big company. There are lots of different uh, parts of it. Uh, for example, we have the ups upstream uh, segment, which is kind of dealing with the exploration and finding the, you know, like a, a new oil gas reserves. I know that they are increasingly using more advanced analytics. Uh, uh, I'm not directly involved with those activities, but uh, I know that the, uh, from the like from the press, they, they've been using such techniques. And on the uh, part um, uh, trading division, which I'm part of, uh, yeah, we are we are using uh, uh, ML-based methods in, in certain areas. But I mean, obviously, uh, where where it's appropriate, right? It's not like you know, it's not like we are a startup or kind of, oh, we are just, you know, we're going to use ML or AI everywhere. Uh, we use it like uh, in places such as, for example, because we are maintaining the uh, physical infrastructure, uh, you have to maintain that infrastructure, whether it's pipelines or, you know, the refineries or petrochemical facilities. Like, for example, you could use that to kind of gather the data about the, the infrastructure and then try to come up with oh, predictive uh, maintenance schedules and things like that. That's kind of just one, one part of it. But uh, on the trading side, it could be like uh, time series forecasting and uh, or understanding the supply demand dynamics. What, what about overall global energy flow? Yes, I mean, that's, the, uh, that's what I was going to um, come at the beginning, like uh, energy markets, uh, also physical markets. It's not just about the paper and financial trading, but there's a kind of a physical mm -hmm. element of it that is essentially from the production of the energy, uh, whether it's from the, you know, like the shell wells or off offshore uh, production facilities or onshore to the actual distribution to the, to the end users, like whether they are kind of retail customers or commercial or industrial. Uh, users, uh, there is a kind of a whole energy value uh, chain which involves the actual physical logistics of the moving the hydrocarbon molecules from one place to to another, and that's basically uh, what what we mean by the by the flows, right? The, how do those hydrocarbon actually from one place to another, and that ultimately affects obviously you know what will be the price, how the market will look like, and if you can really have a good handle on that then you know you could you could be quite profitable uh, that's uh, absolutely fascinating so we did a research project with uh, columbia students over the summer using q learning to try and predict energy market prices and we were absolute failures uh, with it have you guys looked at q learning reinforcement learning and have you 
Do you have any opinion on that uh, method? I mean, not in a specifically in one of the, the projects I worked on, but I mean, uh, I've been hearing about it from uh, you know, like academia and, uh, and, uh, and the world. It's, it's a bit like, um, um, it's essentially, it's like you know, using feedback loops and, uh, and um, essentially kind of training uh, the, the, your, your models. Uh, it, it could make sense. Uh, I mean, interesting you said that <laughs> you're absolute failure. The thing is, I think is the one, well, there's something people kind of forget about the whole uh, machine learning or AI or whatever. It's like they're more focused on the kind of more shiny uh, modeling and kind of the advanced analytics and thinking that that will basically uh, make a difference. But the reality is it's, it's all about data, right? Oh, it's a wonderful uh, point. No, no, brilliantly said, without a doubt. I, I was actually just giving a lecture at Cornell about, uh, I think it was last week, and I said, I said you should get to between 65 and 85% of the way to the end of your problem before you should start trying to use machine learning methods. How do you feel about that statement? Yeah, I mean, I would say even like 90% of the problem is, is the data or all the efforts you put into getting the data in the you know, you know, clean, right format and also covering the data, right? So if you, for example, if you get into this global energy flows problem, you will see that it's like, so kind of uh, big and kind of uh, it's like a branches of trees and uh, you could use oh, very basic data. methods you could just use linear regression to, to model the each market that will probably do well i mean that's that's what most participants have been doing anyway for for years it's not about using the you know latest uh, q learning or you know deep neural networks or whatever yeah. it's like whether you can actually you know kind of categorize or um, identify those areas, get a clean data, and then build up the whole um, kind of the, the, the rig of, you know, getting the, getting the data flowing nicely and, you know, updating frequently and, uh, and then basically building some tools on around it uh, and uh, kind of following it up. Uh, you see that the, in most places where, you know, getting all these things done is not really that that's straightforward. There's lots of manual things, you know, in the process. Lots of uh, high-touch human activity, and that kind of prevents to getting the, uh, you know, getting the best out of the uh, whatever solutions you have. Like, you know, if, if just people kind of maintaining each market manually with some spreadsheets, then obviously you're not going to have the global view, right? Um, if you if you, for example, had a complete model pipelines and data flowing nicely and then you, you will have almost like a real-time visibility around uh, what's happening in the in the entire global energy network have you looked at now casting for any of your real-time analysis so look at what Casting. now casting now casting is is uh, a new machine learning method that professor marcos lopez de prada uh, came out you know with last march because at the time you could use now casting to predict the S&P's movement based on retail data. But actually, I did my own study on now casting and found that it was too quick for the markets. Markets need a week or two to digest information. And now casting is good if you want to you know, monitor a YouTube page. You know. um, but uh, well, how dirty is energy data, I guess, getting to the root of it? Is it very dirty? Is it, you know, I mean, that's, that's you know, being a data science officer at a corporation, be it British Petroleum or JP Morgan, and I heard this from Peng Chang, the head of JP Morgan's machine learning, the data is just still so very dirty out there. Yeah, I mean, obviously there is kind of a clean part of it, which is like more, I don't know, financial transaction, yeah, sure. because we have participants, you know, providing that data. Uh, so if you just, depends on like what kind of data you want to look at, uh, but we, we see like more, uh, it used to be the case that uh, you had to kind of, uh, you have to kind of uh, source all the alternative data set yourself, but now there are new participants in the market who are providing more kind of different data sets like you know, satellite data and uh, you know, some, some other uh, similar or, or kind of the data about the shell. But you will always need, I guess, if you want to have like an edge, you always need to kind of different uh, alternative data, which maybe probably your competitors don't have. So that will be obviously now will be uh, in a kind of a clean, nice format, you have to basically you know, transform it, clean it. Do you have an opinion on satellite and geospatial data as kind of a marketplace or general industry? Yeah, I mean, we, it's very important. Like uh, when we talk about uh, um, uh, shipping, shipping flows, 
that's basically satellite data is very important because all the ships have the, these uh, transporters and they basically transmit their locations uh, regularly, even though you know, some of them try to kind of uh, do some deception tactics and there were some, you know, you will probably know about the uh, pirate activity around the um, Somalian coast. You know, uh, they're kind of a bit more careful, but that's basically how you know about the, some of the kind of the, the, the ship movements, right? And uh, there's kind of a whole system so in our company and also other places and third party uh, um, by third party providers to tracking all these uh, uh, large, you know, crude carriers or LNG carriers. And uh, from that, you try to kind of understand the, the, some of the flows, right? Where the, where the, for example, oil flow in which location to what. And then that problem becomes, um, I mean, on outset, it's kind of simple, but then there's other things going on. Like there's one of the uh, main problem um, we have to deal with is called the uh, ship to ship transfers. So these big ships load up the, the oil and then they come and uh, in certain area, they kind of distribute to the other ships. And obviously they don't really kind of uh, publish, publicize that. So if you want to know where they actually oil done, you have to have some models around the um, kind of detect this ship to ship activity. So there, Obviously, you you learn about the uh, you use the data around the you know what, what is the shape and uh, you know which company it belong, what kind of commercial past commercial relationships that company had with the other vendors, and also yeah you can look at the satellite data literally like you can see that <laughs> some big ship is like you know moving in around the Singapore and you know like uh, there's other ships coming around and transferring the 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 oil. Um, um, so uh, that's the, another like a visual side of the thing, just to kind of um, uh, uh, sense check the you, you know what your model is telling you, and you could do it pretty much in real time. So, can you talk to us about what's been the most challenging big data aspect of your you know even career in energy? You can. Yeah, I mean, as I said, like for me, it's like uh, um, big data. Um, it is like we have like uh, I don't think you know probably like everyone else uh, we won't complain about the lack of data. It's there is data, but you know data is in a very different forms. Or uh, one of the biggest problem is the um, I'll say correlation, right? So you have different data sets. Yeah. How can you kind of correlate them, or how can you find something which is you know there's some sort of a relationship? So that relationship could be. Uh, static or it could be called evolve or dynamic so being able to uh, establish those uh, relationships in a kind of a systematic um, uh, way where you can um, you know those 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 relationships once established can you know function like this it's like setting up a link right and that requires obviously you know cleaning data putting all the processes around the data transformation pipelines and making sure that they kind of work functions so that's one aspect of it. And uh, the second aspect is obviously be able to enable, I mean, data is like fast. So it's not, you know, you can't do it like by, you know, you, you can't just um, ask certain group of people to do it. You have to almost like democratize it. So you have to get everyone involved because, you know, data is generated by everyone. So if you don't have this kind of crowd involvement, then you won't have the, you won't get the good quality data you want, right? I mean, just like why Wikipedia becomes so successful because, you know, so many people kind of constantly contribute it, right? So you, you can't just uh, keep up with it <laughs> with alternative methods. You know, it's, it's a great point you make there. Really great point. This has been a fantastic conversation, by the way. I really couldn't appreciate this anymore. I, I hope you'll be a guest speaker at some of the schools I teach at. You you really have some great insight. I, I, I would talk to you for another hour, but our show ends at 20 minutes, so I... Uh, I, uh, I, I guess we've got a, a draw to a close here. What would you give as advice to an aspiring data science student who's 19 or even a grad student who's 23, 24, who wants to enter the energy industry? Um, I will say like, uh, well, try to learn about the, the energy markets. I mean, when I joined the BP, uh, I had a lot of experience in the in the investment banking, so I knew the kind of the financial engineering derivative side of things. But you know, I didn't really know much about the the, the market itself. So I, I will say the best thing will be like try to understand the the you know how the how the markets operate, what kind of, for example, uh, 
transactions or deals taking place, who are the players, uh, how the markets actually operate, right? So if you have a kind of good understanding, then you'll be able to have a good understanding of the data, you know, those uh, players, those processes, those products generate, and that will make you, you know, a lot better in terms of the whatever model you want to come up with. But if you don't really have a good understanding of the, the markets, just focus on the, you know, kind of the modeling side, then yeah. probably be like a um, useless, uh, uh, <laughs> useless thing, like, because like with the models, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So it doesn't matter if, you know, what, what how sophisticated your model is. Without a doubt. Know, by data, you're not going to get good results. No, definitely. Well, this was a really fantastic conversation and I uh, hope you stay safe during these crazy times and I hope we talk again soon. Thank you very much.